Hello. What's up, people? How's it going? <laughs> OK, so my biggest regret before we actually started this is that I wish I would have seen guys talk like one day ago, because I pretty, I'm pretty sure I hit all the things you said not to do in the presentation part of the keynote. So for what it's worth, I apologize. But you're going to have to live with it for like 45 minutes or whatever. <clears throat> Should we just get started then, actually, in the back? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So we're officially started now, so let's do this. So how many of you are here to learn something about JSON Web Tokens? Raise your hand. OK. How many of you know about them and use them already, potentially? Oh, OK, great. So a lot of you might be upset during this talk. Uh, that's OK. Um, if you get upset, feel free to tweet hate at me. This is my personal Twitter, and that is my company Twitter account. But today I'm going to be talking to you about one of my favorite topics in web security, which is usually a really incredibly boring part of the tech industry, is web security. It's like the lowest, uh, most uninteresting thing humanly possible. So I'm going to try to, to cover it because I'm really passionate about this one topic, and hopefully you will be too by the end of this talk. So a little bit about me. My name is Randall Deggs. I'm the chief hacker at Okta. Basically, I work on a bunch of open source security libraries in Python, Node, and Go. I do a lot of uh, cryptography work. Um, my background is I started doing operating system security about 12 or 13 years ago. And I worked on that for a very long time. And in the last 10 years, I've been spending most of my time building uh, web security tools and frameworks for developers. So to quickly get into it, let's just cover what JSON Web Tokens are for those of you who may not be familiar with them already. So, a JSON web token is nothing more than JSON data that's been cryptographically signed. That's pretty much what it is. Now, there, a lot of people have this tendency to, be, to believe the JSON web tokens are encrypted or really secure, something like that. They aren't. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. They're typically not encrypted. And there's nothing really special about them. So the way you should think about a JSON web token is that it's nothing more than just some JSON data. Now, I mentioned that they're cryptographically signed, so let's talk about that and what a cryptographic signature actually is. Now, if I were to print up a letter to you and mail it to your house and sign my name at the bottom, then when you receive that letter in the mail, you're going to read through the contents, you're going to look at my handwriting at the bottom, and you're going to read my name and see my signature and say, oh, well, I know who Randall is, and I know what his signature looks like, so therefore I trust that Randall is the one that typed this paper up and wrote all this information on there. That's what a cryptographic signature is. It's something that is, is essentially proving that some JSON data can be trusted or some data can be trusted. That's what the purpose of a cryptographic signature is. The way I like to compare this in real life is if I go to the airport and hand the TSA agent my California driver's license, it has things like my age, my height, my weight, all, my eye color, all these things on there. That's like the JSON data on the license. And when the agent looks at that, they know what the state of California is. They know what our IDs look like. They see the watermark of the state of California. They see the coloring. That's the signature on the ID that makes it valid. So that's really what a JSON web token is. It's like a digital passport. Now, how do people typically use JSON web tokens? The most common use case in the way that every, you know, most of you are likely familiar with them is as identity proof, AKA session management for a website. That's the most common way people are using them today. And specifically, the way this works is, let's say you're logging into a website. So you send a website your username and password, you log in. The website's going to validate your credentials and generate a JSON web token for you and return it to the browser in that HTTP request. The website is then going to send any subsequent you know, request to the website. It's going to take this JSON web token out of the browser and send it along with it. That token will always be stored in local storage, and that's basically the gist of it. Does that sound pretty familiar to most of you using these things today? Awesome. And here's the part that gets really annoying to me. So can any of you tell me what happens when you Google JSON Web Tokens? Just shout it out. JWT.io. OK, yeah, JWT.io, right. Well, basically, what you see is a million websites, blog posts, YouTube videos, screencasts, et cetera, teaching you that JSON Web Tokens are awesome and amazing. You have to use them to build secure websites and handle authentication. And the crazy thing about this is that they're all wrong. <laughs> so all of those websites and blogs you read are 100% incorrect. And so what I'm going to walk you through today is really just dispelling that myth. And the reason I want to do it is because even in the security community, I often feel like I'm sort of taking crazy pills 
because even a lot of my coworkers and colleagues sort of like these things, and I think it's absolutely ridiculous. So my selfish reason for coming here to give this talk is actually so I can sort of get you to validate my opinions for me. So that's what I'm hoping to get out of this, by the way. And the real tragedy of this story, which you will learn as we go through this talk, in my opinion, is that even though JSON web tokens do suck, and they are stupid, and they are sort of useless, uh, those are all true. It, part of the tragedy is that people have really forgotten how amazing session cookies actually are and how useful they are, and how, how awesome and simple they actually can be. So I want to talk about that as we go through this story, too. Now, before we can really get into the stuff about dispelling the myths, we need to go through some basic terminology. Now, I hate terminology as next as, as just as bad as all of you, I hope. So we'll breeze through this really quickly. But this should put us all on roughly the same page. So first off, you need to understand what a stateless JWT is. Now, that acronym JWT is often pronounced as JWT. I'll use those terms interchangeably, just so you know. But a stateless JWT is essentially a JSON web token that contains all of a user's information encoded in JSON data. So let's say a user logs into a website, and that user has a user's table somewhere in your back end. And they have things like their name, their age, what permissions they have on the website, what you know, books they might own, just different pieces of information that identify this user. A stateless JWT would contain all that user's information encoded inside of it. Now, how does this work? Well, take a look at the diagram. So let's say a user is logged into a website and makes a request to see a page. What's going to happen is the user is going to send their JSON web token to the website to authenticate themselves via the session. The website server, the server-side backend code, is going to receive the token. It's going to validate it by looking at the cryptographic signature. So earlier, when I mentioned what a signature was, we talked about the letter, right? Like, if I send you a letter, you need to know who I am and what my signature looks like in order to trust the data. It's the same exact thing with the website. It knows that it generated this data and that it can be trusted, and so therefore, this, this stuff's valid. So it's going to check the signature on this token. It's going to validate it. Then it's going to use the JSON web token protocol to view all the JSON data inside of that token. And it'll find all the user's information, their name, their email, you know, what permissions they have, et cetera, and extract that data out. Then finally, it's going to send a response back to the user, rendering a page. And maybe that page includes some of the information uh, contained within the token. So you might render a dashboard page that says, welcome back, Randall. And that name, Randall, was pulled from the token's JSON data. Does that make sense so far? Cool. Now let's talk about a stateful JWT. So what's a stateful JWT? Well, a stateful JWT is the exact opposite of a stateless JWT. So while a stateless JWT contains basically every piece of a user's information, a stateful JWT only contains a single piece of information, which is a session identifier. Now how does this work? Well, if the user makes a request to the website using a stateful JWT, the website is going to, again, validate a token and extract the data within it, which in this case is just the session identifier. Then the website will need to look up that session information by talking to a database. And this database could be something like Postgres, MySQL, a caching server, local memory, Redis memcache. It could be pretty much anything. And this is your typical server-side session management system right here. The database will then return the user's information for the session, extract the information, and finally, render the page to a user. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Awesome. By the way, I'm really casual, so if you run into any questions or anything, just shout them out. We'll make it easy. All right, next up, we have to talk about session cookies. Now, this is like the old school like, definition of session management right here. This is like the legit OG form of web login. Session cookies are basically cryptographically signed session identifiers. So if you have a session ID like 12345, and you cryptographically sign it, which I, I just want to add, cryptographic signatures are not unique to JSON web tokens. They can be used across anything. So you can sign basically any piece of data you want by using this function called a cryptographic uh, signing function, essentially. So a session cookie is basically an ID number that's been signed and stored inside of a cookie. And we'll take a look at how this works. So let's say you have a session cookie, and you're logged into a website. When you ask to view a page, the website is going to validate your signature. It's going to extract your session identifier, just like we did before. It's then going to talk to the database and say, hey, who's the user with the session ID? 
the user information will be returned to the website and the website will render the page to user. This is like the simplest, oldest form of session management on the web. So what you might have just noticed is that two of those concepts I just talked about sounded very similar, right? So session cookies and stateful jots, their diagrams are almost identical in terms of use case. Does anyone know what the difference between the two of them are? Just shout it out. Encoding, someone said? Yes. Now, in terms of things that are the same about them, they're both cryptographically signed, and they both contain the same exact info, a session identifier. The only difference is that in the JSON web token case, in the case of a stateful jot, one of them is using the JSON web token format, aka JSON, and the other is just sending over the session identifier as a plain old string, and that's really it. And we're gonna come back to that concept in a few minutes. So next up, let's talk about cookies. Now, cookies are a really, really interesting thing because they have a bad rep in the web development world today, and that's total bullshit. So I want to just go back and explain the protocol a little bit for those of you that may not know the fine-grained details. Now, cookies are really just HTTP headers, okay? Just like the authorization header, just like the user agent header, they're just a header field. Nothing is special about them. They are the very first form of true NoSQL databases on the web <laughs> because they're basically just storing key value data in a browser, and that's it. And the most important thing to know about them is that you, they have a size limit. So you can basically store at most four kilobytes of data inside of a cookie. Now, how do you create a cookie? Let's say a user logs into your website. How do you tell the browser to remember who that user is? Well, the way you do that is that when you send a response back to the user's browser after the user's logged in, you include the set cookie header, and the format in which you return that header is you say the cookie name session in this case equals and then the value that you want to store in the cookie. Key equals value. Key value store, no SQL. It's the same exact thing as MongoDB. Now, the value you're going to store is usually a cryptographically signed session identifier, which is why I have this uh, function signature here. But that makes sense, right? Awesome. Now, if you want to store multiple cookies at the same time, you can easily do that by using semicolon notation. So you add a semicolon after a cookie definition, then you define as many subsequent cookies as you want. Now, a quick note, when you're using cookies, there's a few cookie flags that you absolutely always need to set when you're doing development in production, and these are really important. Now, quick question for you. What's the most dangerous thing in the world today? Just shout it out. Could be nuclear war. <laughs> Was that Donald Trump? Okay, awesome. <laughs> well, I would argue that it's actually JavaScript, <laughs> because JavaScript is absolutely horrible. It's really bad for the web, it's super insecure, and it's just sort of a shitty language in general. Now, that's my opinion, not a fact, but I'm going to stick with it. Now, what's great about the HTTP only flag is when you set this flag when you're defining cookies, it tells the browser, hey, whatever data you're going to store and remember for me in this cookie, it, that data should never, ever be able to be accessed by JavaScript code ever. And that's awesome, because JavaScript is the root of pretty much all web security problems. Now. The next flag you always want to define is what's called the same site flag. This flag is supported in all major browsers nowadays. This happened over the last several years. It's really great, and this basically prevents an entire vector of attacks called cross-site request forgery, which we'll get into later. And finally, this secure flag is also really legit. It basically tells your browser, hey, if we're not talking to each other over an encrypted connection over SSL, then this operation should not work. We should not store this data. So now we got the creating cookies out of the way. Let's talk about how cookies are read and parsed by the web server. So once a cookie's been set, the user's browser will resend that cookie to the web server on every request the user makes from now until the cookie expires. And the way that that works is via the cookie header. So every time the user makes a request back to the website once they've been logged in, their browser will automatically tack on this cookie header to every request. And this cookie header is the exact same format as the set cookie header that created the cookie. The only difference is the name of the header is cookie instead of set dash cookie. And so what ends up happening is when your website receives a request, it's going to look for this cookie header. It's going to parse out whatever data is found inside of it. And then it's going to use that to get your session ID, to look you up in a database, to handle all that stuff. Does that make sense? Cool. So cookies aren't so bad is the point of that. 
And finally, the last thing we're going to talk about is HTML local storage. Throw your hand up in the air if you're familiar with local storage. OK, cool. For those of you who aren't, local storage is just a browser-based API. It only works in the browser. And it's uh, essentially a key value string store. So it lets you store some data in the browser. I think around 5 megabytes is the limit. Um, and it's basically just a pure JavaScript data store in the browser with no security or authentication involved whatsoever. And we'll come back to this in a few minutes. So now that we've covered the basic terms and we're on the same page, now we can sort of get into the fun stuff. And like Guy Kawasaki, I too have 10, or wait, 11 points to give you. So it won't be too far off his script. So the first myth, and by the way, I'm really bad at counting, so I'm going to need your help as we go through this. But first of all, the first myth I'd like to uh, dispute, really, is that JSON web tokens are easier to use than session cookies. Now, all of the myths I'm going to walk you through today, these are things that I've actually had developers tell me as reasons why they prefer using JSON web tokens over session cookies in the past. These are all based on like actual conversations I've had, things I've read online, really common YouTube videos and comments that I see all the time. So these are legitimate things. I'm not making any of these up. So let's take a look at the facts behind uh, this myth. So if we take a look at JSON web tokens, the very first draft of this specification was drafted really late uh, 2012, right around Christmas. I don't know what the spec author was doing then, uh, but yeah, they decided to release it on December 27th. So early 2013, we'll say. And if you, look up, if you look through their history online, basically no one ever talked or used JSON web tokens for anything until mid-2014, which is a few short years ago. So they've only been around for a couple years, to put this in perspective. Now, if you've ever tried to build a website login system or authentication or authorization or anything like that using JSON web tokens, you know that you essentially need to install a JSON web token library in your framework of choice. And you need to learn how to implement it, how to build out the claims. There's a lot of things you need to know and understand. There's a curve of complexity there to get these things operational in your site. Now let's compare that to session cookies. So session cookies have been around since like 1994, I'm pretty certain. They've been built into every web framework that's ever been created. If you know of one that doesn't support it, please talk to me because I, I would love to know about it. And they basically require zero effort to use. Like this talk has a pretty good number of people in here. Like all the seats are almost full. I guarantee you if I was giving a talk about how do sessions work, there'd basically be no one in here because it'd be super simple. And it, I, we'd be out of this talk in like two minutes and people would just laugh, right? So I think that there's proof that JSON web tokens are not easier to use than session cookies. And so the myth is false. And so if we were keeping score of this, we'd basically have JSON web tokens with a score of zero and session cookies with a score of one. Now, I mentioned a moment ago I'm pretty bad at counting, so I'm going to ask you guys to help. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say JSON web tokens. I want you guys to shout zero. Zero. And then I'll say session cookies, and I want you guys to shout one. one. OK. That sucked, but we'll get better at it. So the next myth I want to talk about is that JSON web tokens are more flexible than session cookies. And this is a really interesting one, because this is a very common uh, argument I hear from people all the time. So let's take a look at the body of a JSON web token. This JSON web token has some user information embedded inside of it. It's, essential, it's essentially just a stateless jot. But then let's take a look at a session cookie and the way you can define it. Now, in this example, remember before, the way these are created is in an HTTP header field. And you can define multiple cookies by throwing a semicolon at the end. You can actually define the exact same data that you would inside of a JSON web token inside of a session cookie. So in both of these instances, I'm able to define the same data just in a slightly different way. And if you'll also notice, the format on the right is slightly more succinct and uses less bandwidth because there's less braces around it. What about more complex data? Well, exactly, yes. I'm about to get to that. Now, the more advanced ones of you in the audience, like this guy, are probably going to say, well, hey, that's actually not a great argument because you're skipping over a really important part, which is that JSON web tokens are much more flexible. They can encode data in JSON, which I'm actually going to say is useless for a moment, and I'll explain why. But they have these really great things called claims, and a lot of these claims have special meanings, and they're included by default in different token implementations. So for instance, JSON web tokens typically have this field called IAT, short for issued at, another field called EXP, short for expires at. And these are both Unix timestamp fields. And these basically tell you when was this token created and when does it expire. 
And this is really useful because if you're building things like web authentication and handling session management, having your data auto expire and become invalid after a certain amount of time is very, very useful, right? Super useful. So it's a, it's a good, good point. But what I would say about that is that in session cookies, you can also define expiry dates. You can tack extra data inside of them. You can always serialize and deserialize the string formats anyways, which is essentially exactly what the JSON web token spec is doing regardless. And so the myth that they're more flexible is actually false. And we'll also talk about this more in a moment. So let's go back to the scoreboard. We've got JSON web tokens with a score of? Zero. And we've got session cookies with a score of? Zero. Okay, cool. That was much better. So next up, people think that JSON web tokens are a lot more secure than session cookies. This is a really big one. Now, secure is a very vague term, but this is what people sort of have this generalization in their mind. And so I want to address this as well. Let's take a look at some, some history here. So JSON web tokens, on the good side, they're cryptographically signed. And as I explained in the beginning, cryptographic signatures is a really awesome way to guarantee data integrity and trust. So that makes them somewhat secure. They also can be encrypted via the JSON web encryption standard. Now, almost nobody does this for a, a bunch of uh, numerous reasons, but I'll give them a point for this anyways. Now on the downside, the spec is rather complicated. Now I'm not necessarily referring just to the JSON web token spec itself, but to the entire Jose family of specifications that JSON web token is a part of. That includes JSON web encryption, JSON web signatures, and several other things which are um, extremely uh, error prone for implementers. And we can talk about, uh, about that more towards the end of this talk. Um, over the last two years, this should actually say two years, uh, multiple vulnerabilities have been found in basically every single major JSON web token library that exists. So if you go and look online and look at the popular JSON web token libraries on jsonwebtoken.io, you can go back through history and read the disclosure reports, but these things are still very new, the libraries are still developing, and, and yeah, it's just a, a relatively common thing. And also, the biggest point in my mind is that this guy right here. There's vastly different support for different parts of the JSON web token and Jose specification in different J JSON web token libraries. Now, let's say for example that you're a Node.js developer and you're building a full stack website in Node.js with JavaScript. You will most likely use the JSON web token library from NPM, which supports the RS-256 form of signing and several other things, but guess what? It doesn't support all the different options in the JSON web token spec. And some of these libraries only support symmetrical, some support asymmetrical, and so you have different options based on these different libraries. Now, if you're using a single language and everything in your product is built using a single tool, this isn't necessarily a problem. But what I see in the real world is when people are building larger applications and they have one part of their stack running on Amazon using Node, one part using Python for backend data processing stuff, one part using Java here and there, the, the vastly different incompatibilities between these libraries really adds up and makes it a very difficult job to wrangle these things together. Now, session cookies, on the other hand, if we take a look at, at the way they work, they're also always cryptographically signed in every major implementation. They can also be easily encrypted in a much simpler and more straightforward way than the JWE specification. They've been around since 94, they've been tested forever. The specification for a session cookie, I basically walked you through the entire thing in that cookie slide before. It's just defining the cookie headers. There's been no vulnerabilities found in any session management based around cookies in default web frameworks as far as I've ever uh, discovered in my lifetime. And there's identical library support for session cookies basically everywhere. So regardless of what type of web framework you're using, what language you're using, you are basically guaranteed to have simple session management using built-in tools. And so just comparing those two things in the track record, I would say that JSON web tokens are not more secure than session cookies, at least not today. And the score would be JSON web tokens at? Zero. Yep, and session cookies at? Three. Okay. So this next myth is actually gonna be shortly invalidated because the, the new European data laws are coming around. But how many of you are familiar with the cookie consent laws? also known as the EU cookie law. Anyone? Okay, one, two, three people, okay. Well, basically, if, you ever, if you've ever been to a website that's meant primarily for EU visitors, you'll notice a lot of the times a little banner at the bottom or top of a page that's really annoying, and it basically says something along the lines of, 
hey, we just want to let you know we're storing your personal information inside of a cookie, and like this website uses cookies. Like, please click here to accept. That actually came about in around 2012 or 2013, uh, around abouts there, when the European Union, Union passed this new law. It's called the Cookie Law, is like the shorthand name for it. And a lot of developers, because when they're building things with JSON Web Tokens, they store the tokens in local storage and not inside of a cookie, they actually thought that one of the benefits that JSON Web Tokens had over storing things in session cookies was that because the cookie law requires you to put this notification on your website if you're using cookies, that JSON Web Tokens let you get around and skirt around the law. And so that was one of the arguments I heard. Now, this is actually completely false information. Uh, basically, the, the EU cookie law has nothing to do with authentication technology whatsoever, and it doesn't have anything to do with cookies. It has to do with any sort of data storage. And the law basically requires you to put that notification on your website if you are tracking a user's behavior. So this would mean if you're using tools like Google Analytics, Kissmetrics, Optimizely, any sort of A-B testing tools, things where you're tracking a user or marketing to them. It has nothing to do with login functionality, which is specifically exempted from the law. So even if you're storing user data or Google Analytics data or anything like that inside of local storage in a JSON web token, it doesn't matter. You're still required to display this banner. It has nothing to do with cookie technology at all. And so the myth that JWTs skirt around the cookie consent law is false. And so we're going to give another point to session cookies. So we got JSON web tokens with a score of? And session cookies with a score of? Four. Awesome. Question, yes? Uh, yeah. Would you review the case when the cookies are shut down in the browser? No. Okay. <laughs> so the question was, will you review the case where cookies are shut down in the browser? Like if your browser refuses to store cookies, right? Or that my user said, I intentionally uh, turned off the cookies. Or if, if the... Oh yeah, if you don't want cookies uh, following you with ads and stuff. So let me tell you something. I use uBlock Origin in Chrome all the time, which blocks basically all the ad tracking networks, all the retargeting, all that stuff completely. And this will not affect that whatsoever. So the cookie consent law is for the provider's purpose to display this banner is required if they're tracking behavior, even if the user has specifically disabled no, I, cookie I, I, access. I, I, oh yeah. Ah, OK, so the question is, if the user has specifically disabled cookie storage, maybe JSON Web Token is a good alternative because it's storing things in local storage. So I'm actually going to cover that in a second. So uh, we'll get there. So this is a big one. How many of you know what cross-site request forgery, otherwise known as CSRF, is? Raise your hand. OK, so we're going to do a quick review then. This should be useful. So what is cross-site request forgery? It's a t very common type of web attack, so we'll, we'll, we will review. Let's say you do your online banking at bank.com. So you go in there and you start checking your accounts, and guess what? Once you're logged into that site, another page of that site is the transfer page, which allows you to transfer money from one user to another user. Okay? And let's assume that this transfer page on your banking website has a form with two input elements. One is the amount, which is the amount of money you want to send from your account to someone else's. And the second element is called the to, the to input field, which contains the email address of a user you want to send all this money to, just to keep it simple, right? Well, what cross-site request forgery is, is if you have a friend who's sort of a jerk, and that friend sends you a link to, with an image inside of it. Let's say they build an HTML page, that HTML page has an image tag inside of it, and that image tag basically has a source that is bank.com slash transfer question mark amount equals a million and two equals jerk at gmail.com. Okay? Now, what ends up happening is when server side developers get lazy or are just not super familiar with this, what ends up happening is if your friend actually opens that link and views this HTML page, when that page is viewed, the browser is going to go ahead and make a get request to the source of the image, which is bank.com slash transfer with the query strings attached. Now, if that website page, bank.com slash transfer, accepts a get request and automatically fills in form fields based on the query strings passed into it, then what can happen is that the user who's already logged into their banking account will automatically 
initiate this transfer, essentially. So the form will be automatically submitted. And so the bank will then transfer a million dollars to jerkygmail.com's account, which is pretty shitty. And then your friend will go take the money, cash it in for Bitcoin, and ride the wave, because that's what you would do. Now, the idea behind cross-site request forgery is it's an attack pattern where an attacker tricks you into doing something on a site that you're already logged into. And the way that it works is via cookies. So if you are logged into a site using a cookie and an attacker knows this, if they can trick you into clicking a link that makes you do something automatically without your consent, they know that your browser will automatically send your authentication cookie back to that website so you'll still be logged in, which means they can trick you into doing stuff against your will. And in the case of this example where you have an HTML page with an image tag embedded inside of it, the user may never even know what's going on because it's a pretty sneaky thing to do. And so one of the really big and uh, one of the big security arguments people have in favor of using JSON web tokens is that they prevent cross-site request forgery from happening. And the reason why is because JSON web tokens are typically stored in HTML local storage. Local storage is a purely JavaScript-based browser API, and it will not, like a cookie, automatically send your authentication tokens to a website. So if you're using JSON web tokens and they're stored in local storage, there's no way for cross-site request forgery attacks to work. Does that make sense? Awesome. But here's the thing, which you might have uh, surmised in the last couple seconds here, but JSON web tokens don't prevent cross-site request forgery. What really matters is the location in which the JSON web token or, or session data for that matter is stored. If your session data or your JSON web token data is stored inside of a cookie, you will always be susceptible to cross-site request forgery attacks. If your session data is stored inside of local storage, you will never be susceptible to cross-site request forgery attacks. And so what's really different here is the mechanism by which the data is stored. But that leads us down an interesting rabbit hole, right? Because that would be a cop-out if I just said, for example, that you know, storing things in local storage is safer. The reality of the fact is that if you use the JSON web token in local storage, sure, you've saved yourself from cross-site request forgery attacks, but you've actually opened yourself up to the single most common, uh, most easily exploitable hack on any website property today, which is XSS, otherwise known as cross-site scripting attacks. Now, here's the thing. CSRF attacks are actually really trivial to fix. There's a very common set of patterns called cross-site request forgery prevention patterns, which basically every web framework and every library for the web uh, implements or there's tools to implement. So if you ever read good authentication tutorials and they're showing you how to do authentication properly, they will always talk about cross-site request forgery. Most modern web frameworks have this stuff built into them by default. So Rails, Django, a lot of the more complete frameworks have that stuff included by default. If you're using tools like Express and Node and other more minimalist uh, web frameworks, there's always libraries that people recommend you use to handle this stuff. Now, CSRF has been around since the late 90s. People are very aware of it, and it's just been handled for a long time. Now, cross-site scripting, on the other hand, just so happens to be one of the most difficult types of attacks to prevent on the web. It's still listed in the OWASP top 10 list, and it's just extraordinarily common and hard to protect. Now, just to illustrate this point, how many of you have ever built a web page where you included a link to jQuery or Bootstrap or Google Analytics or any other sort of third-party JavaScript library into your code? Raise your hand. I should see all the hands going up in the audience. If not, you're lying, because I know we've all done it. Now, here's the thing about that. That's really bad news for your website. And the reason why is because what happens when you include third-party JavaScript in your website, linking off to someone's CDN, or wherever this JavaScript might be stored. You know, I actually see this all the time with people using JavaScript libraries where in their web page they link out to the github.io page for this JavaScript library. So they'll use a version of Vue.js and they'll literally just link to the latest version of Vue.js in a GitHub repository somewhere online. This is super common. And what's bad about that is, well, guess what? If that version changes and does something like, for instance, it says, hey, I want to print off everything that's included in local storage, which is a, a JavaScript-only API, and I want to take that data and I want to send it to my own third-party API, then they will be able to grab all of your JSON web token data, any other authentication data you have, and anything else that's ever been stored inside of local storage, which is a massive, massive issue. 
And you might be thinking to yourself, well, OK, uh, I can completely prevent this vector of attack. What I will do as a developer is I will just never use third-party JavaScript on my website. And that's, that's cool. If you do this, then you indeed will be completely safe from cross-site scripting attacks. And you can then store your session data inside of local storage if you want to. But what I would tell you is this. Google Analytics basically requires you to use a, a, a third-party linked JavaScript thing in your website. You can't really copy it locally because it changes a lot. Same with basically every single marketing tool, every single tracking tool, the Facebook pixel, the Google pixel. Any sort of marketing or advertising tool basically requires you to do this. And those are all the ones that are typically the most vulnerable to these things happening. And so what I would tell you is if you're building a site and you have more than just yourself working on it, it's really not practical to assume that you won't at some point be susceptible to XSS attacks. And you don't have to trust me on it. You can trust OWASP. So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. They are sort of like the internet's think tank for web security problems. They run a massive conference every year and do a lot of publications and writing and speaking. They're really fantastic. This is a direct quote from their documentation. They basically say, because of the issues with local storage, it is therefore not recommended to store any sensitive information inside of local storage ever. And what does that mean? Well, Thinking back to the JSON web token use case, it essentially means that pretty much every blog post, tutorial, screencast, video, et cetera, online showing you how to configure these things using local storage is a really bad idea. You don't want to do that. So if you are doing anything and you're storing sensitive data inside of local storage, you should rethink your strategy because that's not the proper way to handle it. And we'll talk about the proper ways uh, in a few minutes here. Does that hopefully answer some of your questions from before, too? And we'll, we'll talk more about it. So going back to the scoreboard, we got JSON Web Tokens with a score of? And we have Session Cookies with a score of? Great. Next up, JSON Web Tokens are better for cross-domain. So this is a big one. So people say that if you're building login systems that span across multiple domains, so for example, if you have a site that's broken up on www, docs, application, whatever, com, things like that, multiple domains, that Cookies are really bad at solving cross-domain problems because cookies are typically bound to a single domain. And so how do you build authentication systems that work across multiple domain systems, right? And so what a lot of people do is they say, I'm just going to use the JSON web token and store it in local storage. That way, it's not inside of a cookie and I can do whatever I want with it. Now, because I just explained to you why local storage is not a suitable option, instead of me Repeating that last slide, what I'll do is I'll show you the proper way to handle cross-domain authentication using session cookies for the authentication mechanism. And we'll also learn something really interesting about JOTs along the way. Let's say you have a website and the user lands on the public website, which is www.site.com. And the user clicks a big login button and says, hey, I want to log in. Well, that site is going to say, hey, I don't do login. I'm just a static website. I'm going to redirect you to the part of our site that does. So the user gets redirected to something like login.website.com. Well, on this page, the user is going to be, or once the user gets to this page, they'll be shown a nice login dashboard and say, hey, log in with your email and password and hit login to continue. So the user is going to type in their credentials and hit, you know, log me in. Those credentials will be transmitted up to the login service, where it will then validate those credentials, check, you know, the username is correct, the password is correct, et cetera. Then it's going to generate a JSON web token that lasts for 10 seconds. Then what's going to happen is this login service is going to redirect you to the dashboard service. And what's going to happen is going to, the user will be redirected to the dashboard service, which is dashboard.site.com. But in the URL bar, there'll be a query string that says token equals, and then that JSON web token that was just generated. So then what's going to happen is this dashboard service is going to receive this incoming GET request, and it's going to parse the JSON web token out of the query string. Then what's going to happen is it's going to validate that JSON web token. It's going to read the user's identifier, which was stored inside of the contents of this token. Then it's going to create a new session cookie for this user for the dashboard domain. So now the user is logged in using a typical server-side session cookie for this dashboard domain. And finally, the user will be shown the dashboard page. Now, what important thing is happening here? Well, at both the login domain and the dashboard domain, we're generating a session cookie on both of those domains separately. 
Each one has a separate session cookie managing the user's login state and managing their sessions. And what you can see here is that by using the session cookie and not the JSON web token for the user's identity information to actually persist their session data, you are able to have a cookie-based session management system. Now, what I'm using the JSON web token for is actually not authentication. And as a matter of fact, the JSON web token protocol was not intended for use in authentication. What, it was, what its use was intended for is single usage, short duration, passing of signed information. That's the real purpose of JSON web tokens and what they should be used for. So using them in a case like this, where you're using them for a single redirect, single consumption, very short duration, it only lasts for 10 seconds, it's a way to pass information around. Now, is the JSON web token here necessary in this example? The answer is absolutely not. You could also just as easily pass a cryptographically signed session identifier in the URL bar, but I'm just sort of showing you one way where you can sort of work them in into this flow. Now, uh, as we just mentioned, the JSON web token is not suitable for handling the session stuff in this case, and so therefore, you always want to use a session cookie anyways, and so if we go back to the scoreboard, we have a score of JSON web tokens with? Zero. And session cookies with? Six. Cool. Now, I'm realizing we're running really short on time here, right? We only have two minutes in the back, is that right? Yes, okay. I think we're very short on time because we started late. So, I'm gonna breeze through some of these. Do JSON web tokens work better on mobile? No. <laughs> the answer is no, because basically, we're talking about web authentication here, and guess what? Browsers work the same on a phone as they do on a tablet, as they do on a desktop, there's no difference. So, I don't know what else I can say except no. Uh, are JSON web tokens more efficient than session cookies? Yes. No. <laughs> They're not. So here's my proof. I wrote a script, and what I did is I took, I created the JSON web token with a single claim, a session identifier, a 40 character long randomly generated string that I generated on the command line using the pwgen tool. Now, I also have a signing key, which is a 40 character long randomly generated string as well. So both of these things are constant in both of my examples. So what I did is I generated the JSON web token and I printed its compact form and I got the total number of bytes that were used. It's 179 bytes to convey this 40 character session identifier in the JSON web token format. Then what I did is I got the exact same signing algorithm, the exact same code, everything, and I just cryptographically signed the session identifier itself using the same signing key. I didn't do, do any JSON web token stuff, I just did the bare minimum, and guess what? It's only 64 bytes. So what does this teach you? Well, it teaches you that in the best case scenario, a JSON web token is three times larger than its session cookie equivalent in terms of bandwidth usage and network latency uh, happening from A to B. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, guess what? 179 bytes doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> Which is true. If you're making a request to a website, 179 bytes is nothing. Loading React.js is like five megs or something crazy now. So it just doesn't make much of a difference. But think about this. In the real world, when people are using JSON web tokens, they're not using a stateful JOT like this that only contains a session identifier. They're using JSON web tokens that are stateless because they want to cache this data. So they're using JSON web tokens that contain all of the user's information. Now what I did is I went through the last 20 web applications I wrote over the last 10 years or so, and I looked at all the ones that had user logins in them. I went into my database and I looked at my users table, and I pulled out just that user data for a particular user account for my personal one, and I basically created JSON web tokens with just this data. Now these are relatively simple applications. They have some user state in there, so they have things like the groups the user might be a part of, like admins, you know, super users, et cetera. It has some other basic user information, and when I actually generate JSON web tokens, stateless uh, JSON web tokens with this information inside of it, on average, these tokens are about 75 times larger than the equivalent uh, session cookie of 64 bytes. And what does that mean? Well, it means a few things. So first of all, a typical stateless JOT is gonna be larger than four kilobytes of size. And that means it can't fit inside of a cookie. That means it must be stored inside of local storage. And we already know that you can never store sensitive information inside of local storage, and that's bad news. And it's just bad. So basically, it is not more efficient, it's less efficient for sure, and you also shouldn't do it due to security concerns. So, updated score. Now again, I'm breezing through this, so bear with me. The next myth is that JSON web tokens are easy to revoke. This is absolutely not true. The reason why 
is that if you have a token and it's been compromised, then the only real option you have to revoke the token and like basically forcibly log this user out of your site is to change your cryptographic signing key that is used to sign all of your tokens. And this is really bad news because not only will you log the bad user out of your site, you'll log everyone out of your site. Now, a lot of people say, hey, that's really dumb, Randall. We would never do this. We would never log everyone out of the site all at once. Instead, what we'll do is we'll implement this pattern, really common, called an uh, invalidation list. And so what happens in this scenario is every time the user visits the page on your website, you will query a database, usually a memcache server, Redis server, something like that, and say, hey, here's this token someone gave me. Is it valid, yes or no? And the database will just say, yes, it is valid or invalid. Now you are logged out. And the problem with this is that you have now re-centralized everything again, and so you have no benefit from using a JSON web token anyways. The JSON web token is larger, less efficient, more bandwidth usage, et cetera, and you are still centralizing things in the back end, which completely defeats the purpose of the JSON web token from the beginning, and so no, it's not useful. The next argument is that people say JSON web tokens are easier to scale. And this could not be uh, farther from the truth. So as we mentioned before, if you're building a real application, you essentially need centralization on your back end to handle uh, security concerns for sessions. So you absolutely have these things. Um, one thing to consider as well is that, <coughs> excuse me, it's water. One thing to consider is that JSON web tokens can be validated locally without external database access, but then you put yourself at risk of massive security issues like the one I just showed you. Um, session cookies require centralization, just like JSON web tokens do, but the real benefit to session cookies, and the thing a lot of people don't talk about, is that you can easily scale these things up horizontally. So over the, over the last 10 or 15 years or so, scaling session management systems horizontally has become like a one-click operation. Um, if you're building a website that runs on a single server, on any cloud provider, even on your own piece of hardware, you can easily support a website with hundreds of thousands of concurrent users by just talking to a really simple database server. This might be a Postgres server where you optimize and index your queries and have a connection pool. This might be Memcache or Redis. These things are extremely good at handling medium loads of traffic. If you have a website where you have multiple servers and several millions of users, uh, you can also easily handle it by creating a cluster of databases. This would mean having a Postgres, Postgres read slaves, MySQL read slaves. This would mean having multiple memcache servers in a cluster or Redis servers in a cluster. These things are all completely automated if you're using Amazon or Google or Microsoft Clouds, uh, very simple. Finally, if you're absolutely massive like Facebook and Google, what do they do? Well, I'm cheating a little bit here, but essentially they're just clustering things and then geolocating them inside of geographic regions to keep things Super, super simple. This stuff is all achievable in one to two lines of code in most major web frameworks, and it simply becomes a really simple ops problem of provisioning enough elastic cache uh, resources in your Amazon instance, and that's basically it. So I'm gonna give the point to session cookies. And then finally, a lot of people don't realize this, but JSON web tokens were not meant to be used for web authentication. That is not the purpose they were created, and they are not built for security by design. That's not their purpose. So when you have websites where users log in and then start doing bad things and they're using JSON web tokens, well, just think about this for a second. If, I, if my name is Randall and I have a one hour token that expires in one hour and I log in, then I start deleting accounts on the site and doing all sorts of bad things and I'm a jerk. Me as the website owner, I detect this and I say, you know what, I'm gonna like revoke Randall's admin permissions because he's being a jerk, we gotta get him out of here. Well, what's gonna happen if right after my access has been revoked, I'm still saying let me delete everything. Well, the website is just gonna be like, okay, sure. Because if you're only validating these JSON web tokens locally, which is the reason why most people use these, they don't wanna centralize, they don't wanna talk over the network, then you are completely negating security concerns. And if you talk to anyone in the security industry, they will tell you there's always a trade-off between security and speed, always. So if you're doing anything that's security sensitive, like logging users into a website, a billing user, handling medical data, anything like that, you never want to use cache data to make those decisions. JSON web tokens are basically a cache of sensitive information, which is the absolute worst possible thing for security in the whole world. So it's a bad idea. So those are my 11 points. 
And you might just be quickly wondering how, in fact, you are supposed to use JSON Web Tokens. And the answer is that you can use it in a situation like this, where you are using them to handle those one-time redirects, sort of like the cross-domain thing I shared earlier. <laughs> Another quick one I'll just point out is resetting passwords. So if you email someone a link to reset their password and you include a JSON Web Token inside of that email link, you can do some really cool hacks there. I will have these slides online later. Uh, and finally, I'm just going to briefly mention why JSON Web Tokens are so popular, because a lot of people don't understand, like, why would someone give a talk criticizing these things that are so ubiquitous nowadays? And the answer is, it's sort of my fault, and literally my company's fault. There's three companies who are directly responsible for this, including mine. Um, the first one up here is Auth0. They run JWT.io, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. There's Okta, the company I work at today. And there's Stormpath, which is the company I used to work at, a very popular authentication service. And the reason why JSON Web Tokens are so popular is because the security industry is incredibly boring. It's probably the most boring part of the tech industry because nothing has really changed in about 15 years. So the only thing that changes in the security industry is every 10 years or so, a new hashing algorithm comes out and people slightly improve the like, cyclical complexity of generating random numbers, essentially. And so when JSON Web Tokens came out as a protocol, Everyone in the security industry thought, ah, we'll find something fun to do with these. And it just so happens that Auth0 thought, oh, you know what, we'll just use them to cache authentication data to speed up some web services. And they started writing blog posts about it and building tutorials. And guess what? Auth0 is a security company that sells login to developers. And they're heavily, heavily marketing this stuff because they draw a lot of attention and get a lot of registrations from that. My company did the exact same thing. So when I was at Stormpath, we were one of the very earliest adopters of this. We published a lot of blog posts talking about them, both criticizing them and showing valid use cases for them. And we noticed that because this is a new thing in security, a lot of people are heavily interested and invested in it. And so we got a ton of you know, referrals from our blog. People go through, they sign up for our service, we get a lot of customers. And all of us just made a lot of money by basically showing you how difficult it is to use JSON Web Tokens and how easy doing login through our services can be. And so you don't have to take my word for it. If you go and look at Google and you search for JSON Web Tokens in an incognito tab, and you go through and you look at the first three or four pages of Google, what you will see, a very common pattern, is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the top 10 results and many more thereafter, what look like to be educational articles are actually sales pitches encouraging you to sign up to use a service to automate these things for you. So my final call to action, is that I want you to stop using JSON Web Tokens for authentication purposes. I'd love to talk about this uh, more. We already ran way over. Thank you very much, uh, and have a good one. That's it.